that might have been a mistake on my part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> oh, Lord, open my ears, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Praise be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you all. Amen. Do you have an announcement? You look very announcy this morning. <laughs> Some of you uh, probably don't know about this, but each summer we have um, Sunday school where all the children are in one place, we do it by grade, and we ask that people in the congregation uh, see if they can um, participate and, and teach one of our Sundays. You can teach as little or as much as you would like. So we just try to have somebody doing each Sunday during the summer. And um, it's it's simple. Uh, you just have a lesson that you're reading, and, and uh, maybe you might do a craft. It's your choice. 
And then uh, it's summer, usually. I hope it won't rain. And uh, they can go out and play in the playground. So it's very, it's much more laid back. But still, we want that continuance at Sunday school because do we really take a break from the church when it's summer? No. I mean, so, so for Sunday school, we try not to, to break the pattern of coming to Sunday school. I don't have a bulletin board anymore, so I was thinking I could put a sign-up sheet that's on the desk to the right of the mailboxes. So, and then also you can leave new dates that you would be interested in teaching. Put it in the Sunday school box. And I'll plug it in. <laughs> if you want to make a little sign-up sheet, I'm happy to pass it around here. You know, with the dates and stuff like that. If you could, okay. last, I know most years you put it up where the dates are on there and we sign up for those dates. Yes. That would be great. I'm going to do that too. Awesome. But, you know, it took you to find that sheet, you know. So, um, anyway, it, but I'm going to get it on the desk next to the mailbox. So there's designated post there. Very good. Okay. Thank you. All right, a few announcements along the way here. Uh, a quick follow-up to our town hall meeting, which was a couple of weeks ago. Um, and if as a result of that, we are going to do a uh, cottage meeting, um, or two, depending on how much of the need there is. Um, the way that we did this a year ago was Pastor Meyer and Mr. Yee uh, led these cottage meetings. And so we will do those. Um, I'm going to say over over June and July. So if you were uh, uh, if you were not a member here a year ago, you can uh, expect to be contacted about when those are and uh, and kind of when those will be available. They take about an hour, something something like that, and we'll probably do them here at church rather than in someone's cottage. Um, although we will uh, we have a cottage. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. And then the second one, and obviously, uh, well, you can pipe up or if, uh, if I'm missing anything, uh, that we'll do two community planning meetings between now and September to establish priorities on facilities planning. Um, and did you guys set the date for the voters meeting? Yeah, that would be in the bullet. That's, that's, that's why I'm standing here. All right, excellent. June the 2nd. In the second oh, two meeting services in this room okay short meeting guaranteed very good <laughs> very good indeed <laughs> all right thursday we have table talk at uh, jersey's haircuts and brews 7 p.m um and kim prior to that is the great uh, the great kind of cookout mm -hmm. silent auction and all that kind of stuff. Can you say anything more about that briefly? Or you, are you all bulletin mm -hmm. boarded up or clipboarded up for that? For <laughs> something, something else. For something else. Well, well, since you're standing up, let's <laughs> just make it happen. Thursday is our um, end of the year um, academy auction and picnic. <laughs> We're going to see what's going to happen. I'm not sure. Um, I guess the news. Um, the news app just say no rain on Thursday, but our weather app says rain on Thursday. But we will keep <coughs> it posted. I don't know what's going to happen, but it is a big event. Um, we have the um, barbecue masters from church that are cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, and it, it's a lot of fun. And something else, I don't see here. Mr. Nord here. Oh, there's a um, there is a barbecue at church Memorial Day weekend after the second service at 11.45. And it's $5 a person or $20 per family. And <coughs> if you would like to bring a salad or a side dish to pass, that'd be great. And we have some flyers. Um, we'll just ask for you to sign up and we have a number of how much of uh, what to purchase. <coughs> Anybody need a flyer? Are those in the in the bulletin or near the bulletin they or around? They, they were passed out last Sunday, yep. and there are some right now in the mailbox area on the desk. They, they were looking for some at the kitchen to sign up. Mm -hmm. They were looking for some. Yeah, people were looking for some. There are some down there. Better pop up this back down. All right. And one more thing. By all means. <laughs> um, this is our third year of. Bantam fireworks sale for the academy. The first year we sold fireworks, we made five thousand dollars. Last year we made ten thousand. This year we're shooting for twelve. 
<laughs> Good to see you not being greedy. Here. Well, we talked about it at our staff meeting on Thursday, and I and I told the staff we're going for twelve, and they're like, twelve? Let's go for twenty. I'm like, oh, okay, we do it. But to do that, I need bodies. Um, we sell fireworks for a week. We start on June 27th, and we sell till July 4th. You do not have to know anything about fireworks. <laughs> you don't have to know how high they shoot or how long they um, they run. You just have to be able to um, greet someone at the at the booth and then um, show them the product. So I do. It's fun. And if you're not interested in coming out to sell, come out and visit us. But I will say, And buy. And buy. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and where is it at, Kim? Oh, good good question. Um, we are located in the Crossroads area um, by Green Acres, in the Green Acres parking lot. And there are two booths there. There's ours and our competitors. So <laughs> visit, make sure you're at ours. Very good. Does it have a sign that says something like, Holy fire, or <laughs> that just occurred to me just a second ago. Holy smoke. Holy smoke. I like that. I tell you, we're on a roll here. But I need to say, sign makers, maybe I could, uh, I'll, I'll tell those people. All right, there you go. Thank you. Not this Thursday, but the Thursday following is Ascension, 7 o'clock, uh, uh, with a uh, little wine and cheese reception. Uh, to follow. So, not this week, but the week following. This will be 40 days after Easter, which always occurs on a Thursday. I mentioned this last week, 30th anniversary of Holy Cross. Uh, we will be having a uh, special service on September 14th, and we are looking for pictures. Uh, if you have any pictures that you would like to share, you may either email them to Karen Bauman. Uh, which would be ideal. Um, if, uh, if that is not possible, uh, she can scan older photos, put them in her box, and where would you find her box? In the mail box. In the mail room. <laughs> Just checking, see if you guys are awake, um, under Bellman. So, uh, so she, and she will return them to you. Just make sure your name is on it, etc. And we already talked about the barbecue after second service, which is next Sunday. This is my um, typical proof that I was working, sort of working, uh, while I while I was gone. Uh, I was at uh, at the Board of Regents meeting and commencement uh, exercises at Concordia Seminary. Um, and uh, and if you have never been on campus there, it is really a, just a gorgeous, gorgeous campus. It was built in uh, 1926. So it's coming coming up in a, seven years or so on the 100th anniversary of the campus there. So uh, it is a uh, busy time, and a, but a wonderful, wonderful place. Does anybody have any other announcements? All right, let's get to uh, let's get to our topic at hand. So we finished the Ten Commandments. Um, and talked about uh, and talked about um, the close of the commandments and, and had kind of a good I think a very good discussion uh, all uh, for a good portion of the spring here about law and gospel about this notion of of uh, gift what is the gift that God is guarding and protecting uh, through the through the law um, and, uh, and that was a very good very good thing I also noticed one of the uh, one of the professors at Concordia Seminary, um, his name is Tom Eggold. He's kind of on, I keep kind of a running list, uh, running list in my computer of people I'd like to have come out and speak to us and do kind of a teaching weekend sometime. And uh, Professor Eggold is one of them. He's, he, uh, he's an Old Testament professor, Hebrew professor at uh, the seminary, and he just finished his, uh, his PhD. Um, and his PhD was on that, that phrase um, of visiting the iniquity of the of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation, um, really a a fascinating thing. He talked to us about it for about an hour or something like that, and uh, I think it could be a very very interesting interesting discussion. He had a very different take on it than I have often heard. 
Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing. What we're, what we're moving to today is we're going to start to look at, uh, at the creeds uh, and, and then uh, eventually the first article of the Apostles' Creed. But we have a question from the question bucket. And the question is, and I really, really appreciate the consistency with which we get these questions. You guys are consistent. Anyone care to guess what the question is? You've read it before. before read About the... Where snack. is the food in this yeah. room? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> in, order to, in order to answer that question, um, a part of the answer to that question is I need someone uh, who can do some quick math for me and do 25 times 52. Okay? So someone work that up and tell me what it is. About 12,000. How much? About 12,000. About 12,000? 1,200. $1,200? All right. $1,200 a year is uh, a conservative estimate of what it will cost to have food in this room. Because, it, because uh, we figured that the minimum that it would take is uh, an hour a week for our uh, uh, for our janitors to add this room to the cleanup list. We actually have some very small janitors that do clean up on here on Monday morning, and that is um, uh, Kim's kindergarten class comes in here on Monday morning and picks up all of your coffee cups and other random things that are left every single week. So. Uh, so yeah, yeah, maybe we should pay them twenty-five dollars. Um, but uh, but that's kind of the uh, that's the issue is simply where does the money come from? So so I'll let you guys reflect on that and uh, we'll move forward. What is the Apostles' Creed? Well, before we can answer that question, we have to answer uh, what is a creed. In order to answer that, we have to go to God's Word. This is from St. Matthew's uh, Gospel, chapter 16. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. So we find, of course, in numerous places in the scriptures, and, and uh, really we could, we could begin uh, in the Old Testament, but for our purposes, this is a, this is a good place to start. Um, the requirement of, of God's people to, uh, to confess or to to speak what they believe. The word the word creed comes from the Latin word credo, which simply means I believe. Okay, so that's where the word comes from. Um, and we use a couple words kind of interchangeably: creed and confession or confess. And to confess means to uh, to tell the truth, to speak, or to or even a little bit more literally, uh, to speak the same thing, or to speak, speak together. So God says, you're a sinner, and I say, I'm a sinner. We are then confessing to God what God has given to us. So we are saying the same thing about ourselves that God says about us. And God says, I love you, I sent my son to die for you, and I confess and say, I believe in Jesus Christ who has redeemed me. And so we say the same thing back to God that God speaks to us. That's the very, that's kind of the notion or the concept of the creed. And here you get in this, in this episode with Jesus and his disciples, this, 
it, it can't just stay inside. It's got to come out your lips. <laughs> that, that's what it means to confess. If I'm only confessing in my head, then I'm not actually confessing. Um, and so, you know, what are the people saying? What's the word on the street? Some say that I'm Mo some say you're Moses, some say Elijah, or one of the other prophets. But who do you say that I am? That's the, that's the question that Jesus gives to Peter and the other disciples. Who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, kind of on behalf of the whole, but he replies, you are the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter speaks what he learned from his, uh, from his catechism study, what he learned from the scriptures and what he had come to recognize in Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now notice something incredibly important that comes next. Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, which just means son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So this is not something that comes from inside you. It didn't start there, but where did it start? It started in God. So God speaks, and we confess that it's that back and forth. We kind of talked a little bit about this, this rhythm of the Christian life a little bit in the sermon this morning. And here we get that same rhythm that God speaks and we listen and speak back to God what God says, says to us. And over and over and over again in our lives as Christians, it's this pattern of, of listening and speaking. Uh, one of the uh, uh, bonus questions that I give to my, uh, my uh, catechism students, I, I use a, uh, a, a specific definition of prayer. And my definition of prayer is prayer is a conversation God starts in his word. And that's, but that is the exact same con concept. God speaks in his word and we speak back to him in, in prayer. So this goes back and forth, back and forth. Is everybody with me to this, to this point? So in the scriptures, we find a few different um, confessions or creeds. Probably the earliest one, I would say, is, is a Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echaz. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we get that in Deuteronomy. And we get, uh, we see in the book of Acts, uh, numerous times that it seems like the sort of sum up the earliest confession of the church is Jesus is Lord. That that means that he is God, that he is, but he is not simply a God, but that he is my God. So Jesus is Lord. And so we see these confessions kind of uh, grow and develop throughout, uh, throughout time. Throughout, throughout history, along the way. Um, anybody have any, any questions about kind of what a what a creed is? What does it mean to say what to say what we believe? I think that a part of the interesting thing with this, and I'll get to you, Dennis, is that um, is that there's always this interchange that happens, and it's kind of a three way three way interchange. If I was a uh, if, if I was more more on the ball, I'd come up with some nifty graphic for this, but you're, you're gonna just have to use my words instead. Um, and that is, God speaking, the church is confessing, you know, so I didn't write the Apostles' Creed, but I learned it and confess it, and then making that confession my own, and, and learning to be able to speak that word, that that confession of faith as my own in my own words and kind of conforming 
my words to the words of the church, which are the conform to the word of God. So it's those kind of that part, and that's kind of what we do as as Christians is we teach our children God's word. Um, we teach them the the creeds. We teach them the Lord's prayer. We teach them these words that have been given to us. You know, hymns, the you know the the liturgy, the language of faith. We teach them these things, which are which are also kind of getting them into the groove, if you will, of learning these words, these confession, and they come to take that as their own. But that is a continual cycle. It's not a one-time shot. It's not like when you're when you're confirmed, you get this sort of inoculation. <laughs> That okay, I'm never going to have any questions again for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, right? We don't get that. <laughs> Thank God we don't get that. First of all, the last thing I want to add to confirmation is a shot. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. <laughs> I hate shots to begin with. Um, but uh, but we don't get that. What we what we teach is this pattern of hearing God's word learning how the church has confessed this and taking that as my own and, and, and even adding and using my own words to do that. And whenever that cycle is broken, and that can be broken either by no longer hearing God's word or no longer confessing and learning how the church has historically confessed that or by no longer learning how to take that as my own Confession and put that into my own word and language. Anytime one of those three is kind of interrupted or broken or messed up, sooner or later the whole thing kind of falls apart. It may not be right away, and we're always kind of a work in progress. And it may be that there are different times in our life and in our instruction when uh, there's more of one than of another. But that's the that's the pattern. That, that continues over and over and over again. Now, that Just um, I wondered if you could speak to, when you're teaching the youth the confessions, and there are moments, Pam's talked about this too, when the kids just get it. Right. Can you speak to some of those moments? I mean, sure. With the creed, I mean, it's right. Well, and 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 I think that's the that is that's the continual process that happens is recognizing that the faith that the four-year-old confesses is going to be confessed differently than that of a 10-year-old, or 15-year-old, or 25-year-old. It doesn't mean that the faith is different. Like, you know, there's, there's one faith, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, as we hear in, in the book of Ephesians. But that because I... Because we all grow and change, how that is articulated, how that comes out, comes out in different times and different places. But that's that is always the the, the joy of of teaching and of learning is is seeing that kind of bing, <laughs> seeing the light go on <laughs> on a certain thing or you know a topic or portion. And that is especially true when it comes to the faith. Um, and a part of what, what we have to continually learn as a church, as a congregation, as families, as individuals, is to recognize that that cycle of hearing, learning, learning the confession that the church has spoken, learning to make that confession my own, that that cycle all, is always happening, that that doesn't, that that when, when that is interrupted, um, then faith starts to, uh, starts to get attacked. Well, and faith is, of course, always attacked. But, but it is when that, when that being fed by the word of God, uh, learning to confess in the, in the liturgy and the creeds and the hymns of our church and all these things, how that faith has been expressed through the ages, and then how, how that becomes mine now here, when that is interrupted, that's when things really go haywire. And that, and that becomes incredibly challenging. And what makes that challenging for the church, I would argue, is, is that we have to be doing 
all of these things all the time. You know, this is not something that is a one-time shot, but this is why we have adult education as well as Sunday school, right? This is why we have um, this is why we have uh, smaller Bible classes as well as this big Bible class. I would broadly say that this class is more about kind of teaching what the church as a whole teaches, and that smaller Bible classes are much more about learning how to take that confession and make it personal, make it my own. And it's not an absolute, but it's a lot easier to talk about that with six people than with six people. There. Yeah make your job more uh, more complicated is I would say that there's another interruption. I believe it. And that is when uh, when I not, I'm guilty of it. When you've done it so long and you've got this stuff memorized that you don't need uh, you don't need the, uh, right. uh, the the eulogy and you're on autopilot. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, I would say that that's not another. I would say that that's the interruption to number two and three. Is, is that uh, how many of you have ever gone to church and then at the end of the church wondered what, what you actually said. <laughs> I have, and I'm the pastor. <laughs> and, and that we all kind of have those, those um, autopilot, autopilot moments where you kind of uh, uh, get, into, get, into the, 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 get into the routine. And I am a big believer in routine. I am not at all thinking routine is bad. But you get into the routine uh, to such a point that that you you lose that that tie between the word of God, the confession we're making, and, and making this confession my own. And that happens all the time. This is a this is a continual cycle. And this is also why, by the way, it is such a gift that I can have one of those Sundays where, huh, I wonder what I uh, I wonder what I heard. Or what I preached, <laughs> um, or I can have one of those Sundays and still trust that God is God is still at work, even when my attention wanders, even even when my um, autopilot kind of is, is autopiloting me, me over the cliff, um, etc. That God is still at work in this time and place. That's a big thing. I see a few hands. Jill, Ada, Barbara, Howard. One of the first times in confession and creeds when we came alive, we were two different types of services, mm -hmm. but we all faced each other. Mm -hmm. And we confessed the creeds. So we were speaking. Right. We weren't just talking to backs. Right. We were talking to people's faces. Right. That's and interesting. That was a very, um, that was kind of a powerful thing. The back circle was for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know about anybody else. Yeah. Um, but I really thought that had a really. Well, and, and I, and this is, and there's a, there's a move that happens. That I that I think is a very interesting one. You're in, and you're kind of getting at it there, and that is that that I'm not I'm not confessing the creed simply to God, although I am doing that. We're doing it. We're doing it right, I'm doing it um, to God, but mostly I don't know. I'll have to think about this. Um, but I'm doing it for each other, you know, because God knows what I believe. Right? You know, it's not like this is some, what? <laughs> she thought that? You know, it's not like this is a surprise to God, right? Um, but I am speaking this um, for, the, for the sake of all of those who are around me. And that is more obvious when it's done around the dinner table um, than, it, than, it is, uh, than it is in corporate worship. I, 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 I agree, and I can see that, see how that would benefit. Uh, I think Ada was next. Yes, um, I have a question. This is something different. Uh, it said that um, it was revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. Right. How do you um, think that it was revealed to Peter? Through um, his contact with Jesus or a vision? or? Um, I would say not a vision, but that the, that the whole point of this is, is through the teaching of Jesus and through the scripture. You know, think of that. Did he, um, did he have the scriptures? Sure, he had the Old Testament. That's the Bible. That's the scriptures, and that's and that's kind of the point. I mean, we have more scriptures than Peter had, but that doesn't mean that he didn't have it. Um, that he has the scriptures, and that the scriptures, you know, these are they that testify of me. 
You know, or think of uh, think of Jesus with the disciples on the Mass and taking them. He showed them in all of the scriptures the things concerning him while he's talking about the Old Testament there. <laughs> because there is no New Testament. So, yeah, he absolutely has the scriptures. Because, but, because they weren't um, readily available, were they? Um, but they learned them, and they knew them. And this is something that the ancient world really has over us, you know, in a way. That, that the ancient world was used to learning things by heart. Because, because you know, they didn't have a, a, you know, a Bible app on their on their phone. You know, they didn't have a book that they could that they could pick up. What they but what they had was their mind and their hearts. And so they would they would learn these things um, by heart. A part of how the scriptures were passed on in the early church was that. Um, was that you had the the office of lecturer, and I would a reader, and I would argue that that in many cases what that meant, especially in the early years, was that when a book, you know, like uh, Paul's letters are kind of are kind of moved from place to place, um, and a part of what would happen is when when Paul's letter to the Galatians got to your place, all right, you know, lector lector Bob. Uh, your job is to memorize this book. So we've got this book in our collective memory. So that when that when we're ready to hear this, you're the lector for that. Why? Because because you've done it. <laughs> you've learned this. And that and that notion that the scriptures belong to the community is is one of the pieces that I would say that we've that are um, this is kind of an extension of familiarity breeds contempt. Because we have the Bible um, available all the time, I therefore no longer have to read the Bible. You know, we could call that the Googleization of spiritual life. You know, because I've got the divine index available at all times, I no longer actually have to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it. Um, and there's and there's a, there's a notion of of learning that to have this, and I don't just mean rote memorization. Don't don't mishear me here, and I'm not, and I'm really not saying this in a, uh, you know, kids these days don't do any work and trying to be crabby pants. Um, but, but we, there's no question that culturally we have lost the idea that um, that in order to truly get something, it has to be it has to be internal. Maybe one of the places that I still see that is in music. You know, most of the time, if you go to a um, if you go to a musical performance, a vocal performance at least, it's expected that they're going to have everything memorized. Um, so there, you know, there are places, and there's certainly a place, you know, that that happens in different ways. But this is something that we in the church, I would argue, have to continually put before each other: is how do I, how do I, how do we spur one another on to to continue to make the scriptures our own? So that this confession continues to happen, because this is how God, this is how faith grows, is through God's word and spirit. This is 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 that's how it's revealed. That's the word revelation, and that revelation comes through His word. It doesn't. It God does not sap us with things. God is not a sapper. Um, that's God works through His word. That's how He promises. Speak to us, and that's and that is where this confession comes from. Uh, Barbara, then Howard, then Paul. Uh, that was a long time. You're I know. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I know. I am too. That's kind of my hope is that I'm going to keep it. Can I say that out loud? Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe in being on autopilot and. Um, in routine and um, repetition um, and therefore I am saved by the grace of God when um, the moment comes when the light goes on sure. and I am reminded that in the middle of the week I am reminded that that's what you heard in the sermon last week because I went through it routinely, wrote and then right. I go home and 
you know, things happen and... You got it. Like, and this is why, by the way, why why we do Holy Cross of Prayer the way that we do. Holy Cross of Prayer uses all of the readings from Sunday, from the previous Sunday, so that you're going to hear those throughout the week, and you're going to hear those meditations, which is going to be a slightly different take than what you heard on Sunday. But you may, but you may also still hear those things from Sunday. That is exactly the point, because that is to is to kind of stir both our imagination and our remembering. How? Oh, I'll go out on a limb and say this business of confessing a creed is only for Christians. An unbeliever cannot, he can repeat those words. say the words. But it's yeah. not what we define it. Yeah. Okay? And yeah. so that's shown in the scriptures where the devil comes along. He knows about God. Right. He knows the Bible. He started saying that right. and God took the devil out of people. Right. And God, uh, Christ, basically told him to shut up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's the temptation in the wilderness is that is that uh, Satan starts quoting scripture. So we're not simply talking about a kind of, uh, this, is, this is not divine trivial pursuit. This is not knowing that all of the facts means that you get it all. This is deeply connected to faith <laughs> and actually trusting and believing and confessing these, this faith that has been delivered to us through his word. Yeah, and furthermore, that God has promised that when we're being persecuted, Mm -hmm. And we don't know what to say. He will put those words in our mouth. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Paul. Yes. When I was a younger man, creed was one of the things that couldn't be discriminated against, like race or gender or something right. like that. Yeah, that's true. But now it seems like creed has fallen off that list yeah. and has become the top of the list of what can be discriminated against. That's interesting. In other words, what yeah. we say yeah. is what people attack us with. Or come out against. Yeah, so. that's in, that's in, that's an interesting observation. That's um, and and of course the point of that, you know, race, gender, creed was was it didn't matter what someone believed, you treated them the same. Exactly. Right. That's the that's the point behind that, um, which is which is still true. You know, especially in terms of you know showing mercy. You know, we don't show mercy simply to people that we agree with. That's not actually mercy. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what that is, or not. It, it's it quickly kind of loses its merciful nature. It becomes hypocrisy. Right. It becomes hypocrisy. Right. I'm only going to help people that I like. Um, it kind of misses it along the way. Um, I want to just kind of get this in into our head um, to get us started, so that we can start on the first article. Mary, you got a quick. Comment or question? Yeah, I just okay. want to thank you for putting that on Facebook because sometimes in the middle of my work day I'm insane. Yeah. And it allows me to sit down and go. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. You're talking yeah. about Holy Cross of Prayer. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is something that um, Heather Kirkpatrick has uh, kind of took it upon herself to say, okay. I want to see these on Facebook so that we have more good stuff on Facebook and less junk. Yeah. <laughs> and I so, can't thank you enough. yeah. Well, don't thank me. Thank Heather. Okay. Seriously, she's not. She's not here this morning. But, um, but yeah. And I've had that comment from a number of people. Uh, so, so briefly. Um, so we've got that's what a creed is, and we talk about the creeds. Uh, we usually mean three, uh, three things. The, uh, what's called the Apostles' Creed, um, which is roughly 150 A.D. The Nicene Creed, uh, which is 325, with a slight um, addition in 380. And then the long one, the Athanasian Creed, which frustratingly enough, was not written by Athanasius, but which is, I don't know, 450-ish, something like that. So all three of these creeds are the um, are what we refer to usually as the creeds. Um, we use the Nicene Creed 90% of the time in church, because the Nicene Creed was kind of the fellowship creed. This was the communion creed that, that established that we were in fellowship with one another. 
um, the Apostles' Creed was primarily associated with holy baptism. Um, and, uh, and so that is, that is used specifically in connection with baptism. I do sometimes use the Apostles' Creed uh, during the service as well. So like we use that during Lent, I think we used it in Advent, we'll probably use it in August. So we'll use that some of the, some of the time as well. But the Apostles' Creed is really meant as the, uh, really the baptismal creed or the creed for the home. And then the Athanasian Creed, uh, we usually speak that on Trinity Sunday, um, which is the Sunday after Pentecost. So this year that'll be in the middle of June somewhere. But those are the creeds. And, and what we have in Luther's small catechism is the Apostles' Creed and the explanation to the Apostles' Creed. So, that's, so what we're going to do next week is we will look at the first article of the Apostles' Creed and what that and what that means, and then we'll kind of go forward from there. That's what we're doing. I'm almost certain of <laughs> Let's. This is the most certainly true. There you go. Let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.